So, our next speaker is um, Henry Walsher. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And uh, he, he, uh, he heads the Spatial Vision Enterprise GRS development team, designing, developing, implementing, and supporting spatially based software systems. And in his spare time, Henry is passionate about GIS, Python, and spatial technology, so you really love your job. Uh, so please welcome Henry and his talk on starting fires in national parks, a proof of concept Python toolkit for effective landscape fuel hazard management. All right, um, everyone can hear me? Wonderful. All right, so we all know uh, Australia is a, a fire-prone country, so uh, thanks to Nathan from the speech beforehand, um, but certainly from my experience, these are a couple of the examples. Now, we all have a personal connection to fire in the community in Australia. Um, I'm, I think, luckier than most. I've been involved in in some way, at least, uh, three major fires have had significant effects on my life. So when I was growing up, quick bit of personal history for me. Um, just before I started university, I was down here in Melbourne on holidays over the Christmas break, and the 2003 Canberra bushfires broke out. Now again, I'm very lucky, so no one in my family was hurt, no one was harmed, no one lost their homes. But I know other people that did. And it had a profound effect on me because I can still remember the day that I tried to call home, find out what was happening, and couldn't get through on the telephone line. You know, that's, that's always stuck with me, and it's been a long time since. So, when I started my first job, I was working at Geoscience Australia, um, back up in Canberra as well, and in 2006, there were, again, over the Christmas break, Australia, you know, the convenient summer, um, we had fires down here in Victoria in Benalla, and again, I, started, I decided that if anything I could do, I would. And it turned out that they needed some volunteers to come down and help out with bushfire mapping. So being a GIS person, being a bit of a map nerd, and being someone that was, you know, at least interested enough to get involved with the whole process and wanted to see what I could do to help. I came down and I spent some time with the fire brigade or the CFA up in Benalla helping them map fire extents during that uh, bushfire event. And of course, I wasn't the only one there. Um, and it wasn't organized by me, it was organized by Geoscience Australia, but it was a really valuable experience for me. And it really shaped the way that I think about emergency management and disaster management in Australia. So, flash forward to the 2009 Black Saturday bushfires. And of course, still at the time I was up in Canberra, um, but I was involved in a group called the uh, MAPS group, which was the Mapping and Planning Support group, which is just a volunteer organization in the ACT. And we worked with the emergency services um, to provide mapping assistance when it was needed. So we worked with Search and Rescue and with Fire Brigade in the ACT. And of course, for the Black Saturday bushfires, obviously it was a huge event. Um, it was a tragic event because so many people lost their lives. So I volunteered and I came down to Victoria to help with the recovery event. And this isn't my photo, but it's one of the very similar uh, images to what my memory of those events were. I came down to help with the recovery effort with Operation Royals. So I didn't see the fire myself. I sat in a police station up in King Lake. I saw a lot of burnt trees and truly had a, I won't say happy experience or exciting experience, but it was a very enlightening experience. And again, it's really shaped the way that I think about dealing with fire and think about dealing with emergency management, and it really is something that I'm passionate about. And in a very real way, it's the reason I'm here today, because without the 2009 fires, I wouldn't have moved to Melbourne. After that point, I decided that no, it was time for me to move on. I came down here, moved to Melbourne, started with DSE before moving on to consulting. So I'm here to talk to you about starting fires in national parks, which is an exciting topic. Um, and probably pretty controversial. One of the big things in Australia is that fire is an important part of our natural uh, landscape. It's part of the life cycle of our native forests and many species in our native forests actually require fire regularly to reproduce. If we didn't have fire in Australian forests, then we wouldn't have Australian forests. 
So we have some bank seeders, for example, which require the heat of the fire to uh, drop their seeds and to reproduce. We have species of eucalyptus that require the soot from the fire, the smoke, to actually trigger the reproduction cycle. And then we have other species, again, which rely on the ash in the soil for the seed germination. So it's an important part of our natural landscape. And obviously, we can't prevent fires altogether. There's two main causes in, of fires in Australia. We have um, naturally occurring fires, which tend to come from lightning strikes. And then we have the human occurring fires. And those we can do better at preventing. Um, in some cases, we want to. In other cases, which is what I'm talking about today, we don't want to. So what I'm talking about today is hazard reduction burning. Now, hazard reduction burning uh, is an important step in forest management in Australia. Um, so one of our projects this year with the company that I work for now, Spatial Vision, we've been working with Parks and Wildlife New South Wales. And one of their responsibilities, among other departments in New South Wales, is to perform hazard reduction burns. Now, hazard reduction burns, if you don't know what they are, are a very controlled way of reducing fire fuel load in the environment. The idea is that by using the knowledge that we have of the natural environment, as well as our knowledge of the fuel loads in the area, we can send teams in to reduce those fuel loads. So if there is a fire later in the year during fire season, that fire won't have as much of an effect. Okay. The idea of the definition of a controlled burn, and I'll read this out, and I'm sorry I can't ever get these things memorized, is it's the controlled application of fire under specified environmental conditions to a predetermined area and at the time, intensity, and rate of spread required to attain planned resource management outcomes. So the basic idea here with any hazard reduction burn is it's an efficient way of reducing the fuel mass within a particular region. And in general, we're looking at, of course, national parks in, in uh, the ACT. Oh, sorry, in Australia, not the ACT. Um, so, legal responsibility for hazard reduction burns. Essentially, the New South Wales Fire Act 1997 outlines the duties of public authorities and owners and occupiers of land to prevent bushfires, but essentially there are four main agencies in New South Wales that have to deal with uh, hazard reduction burns and bushfires. You have, obviously, the Office of Environment and Heritage, uh, you have New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Service, you have the Rural Fire Service in New South Wales, and you have Fire and Rescue New South Wales, who are the Metropolitan Fire Service Agency uh, in Sydney and in the surrounding region. And one of the big things in New South Wales, particularly recently, is that there's an ongoing commitment to hazard reduction burns in a way that allows New South Wales, as well as you know, any other states that adopt this practice, to minimize the loss of property, minimize the loss of life from an unplanned fire event. So you have, for example, um, recommendations from the Wombolong Fire Inquiry uh, to the New South Wales government, which essentially says that the New South Wales government must supply funding for hazard reduction burns across New South Wales to reduce risk to life and property. A lot of this came out of the fire up in the Blue Mountains, which we saw the video of earlier, um, but also, of course, the results of the 2009 Bushfire Royal Commission. So we have best practices in bushfire management. And it turns out, actually, for us in Melbourne, the best practices are here in Victoria. Um, one of the biggest things in Victoria is, obviously, after the 2009 bushfires, we had the T Bushfires Royal Commission. Um, and a lot of the um, Royal Commission results have been implemented here in Victoria, and we have a lot of ongoing studies, a lot of ongoing work by very dedicated people into how we can manage bushfires effectively. So Victoria, the Inspector General for Emergency Management, has recommended risk reduction targets as the most effective form of performance target for bushfire fuel management. And this is as opposed to just a simple hectare target for burn management. So originally in New South Wales, New South Wales has a current 5% target um, of burn management. So the idea is that for all national parks in New South Wales, they want to burn 5% of the area of those national parks every year to reduce fuel. The problem is, at the moment at least, in New South Wales, there hasn't been enough work into looking at the areas they're burning to reduce risk. The areas they're burning, it's worked by the different management units in the different regions. And I'll show you just how much of an area we're looking at in just a moment. But unfortunately, because there's no 
true risk um, analysis method. There's no method that they can use in New South Wales to say to people, okay, this is why we're burning this particular region. Um, what's tended to happen is that the high risk areas, the high areas um, which people from their knowledge of the area, um, from their understanding, from their work in the field have dealt with before tend to get burnt over and over again as part of that 5% fuel reduction load. And we don't want that because surprisingly forests tend to grow. And as forests grow, more fuel is produced. So I'll give you a quick look at the scale of the area we're looking at. Okay, so this is obviously New South Wales. Uh, all of these uh, orange and uh, blobs are essentially burn unit areas. So every national park in New South Wales is made up in terms of fire management, from the parks and wildlife perspective at least, of a series of burn units. So in these burn units, there are, uh, if it helps, 14.5 thousand burn units across New South Wales. These are managed by different fire management groups. There are 89,000 square kilometers of land in New South Wales. So that's not an insignificant area, okay? And these are defined as asset protection zones, uh, APZs, SFAZs, or strategic fire advantage zones, and land management zones. And really, for us here doing this work now, um, what those actually mean don't matter too much, but what they are is essentially areas um, of increasing importance. So a APZ is an asset protection zone which basically says this is the zone around your house that you need to have clear with minimized fuel so that when there is a fire that comes through, your house is at a much reduced risk. A SFAS is essentially the same thing for other assets, um, whereas a land management zone tends not to have as much strategic importance attached to it. So what do we do? Part of the role of bushfire unit managers is to classify risk. So if you're in an area that is prone to fire, um, or if you're managing these national parks, you need to be able to say which areas of these national parks are more at risk of fire, and how can we control it, and how can we use our limited budget and time for hazard reduction burns to uh, do our burns or do the work that we need to do as much as possible. Okay? And the basic idea here is to rank burns uh, so that we have, or back burn unit boundaries, um, rank burn unit boundaries so that we can say this burn unit boundary at this particular time with this particular fuel load is of more importance for us to control, to manage than this other burn unit boundary over here. And of course this is um, very subjective, but it does come from a very hard science background. We have very good models, large scale models across New South Wales of fire fuel loads. Um, obviously we have very good simulations of fire fuel loads as well, or the spread of fire, the likelihood of the spread of fire. And we have a very good idea of the environmental risk as well as the strategic risk of particular zones. So we can rank things. And in general, a very easy way to rank things from a risk modeling perspective is a simple one to five scale. Um, basically, one is low risk, five is high risk. And we can combine any two particular combinations of risk, for example, strategic value, which says, you know, is this particular piece of land more important to prevent uh, having an uncontrolled fire event than another particular land, piece of land, and fuel load, to give us a simple ranking of one to 25. And so we get something like this. So we get a simple risk matrix. Um, now, if you've done any risk management before, this should be probably pretty familiar to you. Um, and the values here are pretty arbitrary. Uh, down the left-hand side, we have the likelihood the strategic value will be achieved, which basically says, um, based on the amount of fuel in this area, um, five being lots and lots of fuel, one being not as much fuel, if that stays the same, what is the likelihood that the strategic outcome or no uncontrolled burns is going to be achieved. And across the top, uh, we have the impact on uh, strategy outline. So essentially, this is the lowest strategic value to the highest strategic value. Do we care about this piece of land as much as we care about another piece of land? Okay. And based on that simple 25 scale, one to 25 scale, we can go further. We can classify uh, fire, our fire risk levels into essentially levels that are acceptable risk, it's a conditional risk, 
or it's a completely unacceptable risk. So the idea here is to have a look at the areas that we have, and an unacceptable risk says that within the next fire season, within the next cycle, we would prefer, or this should be, have a fire reduction fuel management burden take place. Whereas a conditional is, if possible, we'd like to do some fire management fuel reduction burns, and an acceptable risk is, of course, somewhere where we don't actually need to prioritize a fire risk burn at this time. So we can start with some pretty sensible cutoffs. And we can actually do some very simple calculations. Okay? We can have a look at statewide values for fire risk. So we have a fire risk from 1 to 23 here, because that's currently, based on current modeling, what fire risk is in national parks in New South Wales within these burning units. And we can make some reasonable assumptions. We can say that you know, a fire risk level of 11 or below is probably acceptable. And a fire risk level of 21 or higher is almost certainly unacceptable. And we want to be able to do something about that. So you get a very simple modeling here, although I think the numbers are a bit out. Thank you. Um, so we have a divide between unacceptable, conditional, and acceptable. So I haven't mentioned any Python in this talk so far. Um, I've mentioned a lot of policy and a lot of decisions about science. Um, but I'll start talking about the Python now. And the reason that we want to start talking about the Python now is because currently, to go from a uh, simple risk model with two values, in fact, we have several different models of risk for environmental values, strategic values, fuel values, and so on, um, there's actually a 16-step manual process um, to actually get through from a risk model through to a planned and evaluated burn program for the next three years, um, which is the way that New South Wales Parks and Wildlife works. Okay? And you'll note there, 16 is a bit of a lie. There's a few more than 16 because we have things like 6A, 6B, 6C. Um, but really, what we're actually doing here in this project is to try and reduce the overhead and reduce the likelihood for human error, for mistakes, when we're actually doing these kind of risk calculations. We want to make this as simple as possible um, and, in a sense, run simulations. So we want to be able to take a look at different scenarios, um, say that this level is unacceptable, this level is acceptable, and do this quickly without people having to sit there in front of a computer manually typing in numbers and doing these manual calculations. Okay? So I'll give you a quick squiz now. This is the bit of my demo that gets a bit risky. Um, come on, work. Yes. Okay, so I can show you a tool that's running. This is the first part of one of the tools that we actually built in ArcGIS. Um, there we go. This doesn't run very long. This is actually around the Barara Valley State Park in New South Wales. And you can see here um, that based on a couple of simple risk levels, what we've done is run a quick solution. Um, and hopefully this will read roll correctly. Come on. Yeah, there we go. Um, we've run a very quick solution that calculates an acceptable, unacceptable, and a conditional values based on the user inputs. And you'll note there that took about 10 seconds to run. That was just recorded on my laptop here. Um, so this is not a particularly difficult calculation to perform, but it is an issue where if you're doing it manually, it's very time consuming. If you can do it in an automated way, it's actually very, very quick because you can do it repeatedly. It's really simple. Um, and the reason we're doing this, human error is a problem. So human error is us saying that I want someone to sit down in front of a computer. I want someone to sit there and record what these burn units are. I want someone to sit there in something like Excel, which is basically what people have been using up to now. Sit there in Excel and say, OK, based on this risk level, based on this, um, based on this strategic value, based on this environmental value, this is what the overall risk of this area is. Is this acceptable, unacceptable, conditional? And one of the biggest issues there is, of course, that that's not repeatable. Depending on who's doing it on any given day, you have someone sitting there who might say that this area is unacceptable, and they might say that it's conditional the next day. Um, we need to be able to repeat that. And that's part of what the tool that we built was aimed to do. So part of our outputs, excuse me, from this tool have been to record the input metadata. And that's, of course, key in any kind of scientific application. But one of the key outputs is to record that metadata so that any time that they run a model, any time that someone in that group produces an output, that is recorded and that can be repeated again. And it's justifiable in terms of the science. So how do we do it? Well, the first thing to remember 
is that spatial is not special. Um, as a GIS person, uh, I like to think it is. I'm a big fan of maps. I love playing with maps. But really, it's not actually that special from a data analysis point of view. Uh, you look at it, spatial data is stored as a table. Uh, so it's pretty much like any standard table in a database or in Excel. The only difference really is that we have a geometry on the side. So we have some piece of location information along with it. But really, all that is is another data type. And for the majority, for non-GIS people, um, to give them access to these tools, we want to make it as simple as possible as an interface. Um, so we don't want people who don't understand how to deal with the spatial data, how to deal with the tools like ArcGIS, which you know, is huge. It's a very powerful tool, but also has a very high barrier of entry. We want to make it as simple as possible. So we use, thank you, pandas. We have people still writing their calculations, doing their initial work in Excel, because pandas reads and writes Excel very easily, and it's a very simple way of working with tabular data. Um, and it is the library for it. So we have people, I'm more than happy to have someone sit there and do ca their own calculations, prepare some data in Excel, and then read it into a system like ArcGIS in Pandas. I would much rather that they did that in a system that they were familiar and comfortable with, because again, that's going to reduce the likelihood for human error. And one of the nice things is, if you're familiar with ArcGIS, the primary scripting environment of ArcGIS is Python. Has been for many, many years now. It's Python 2.7, sadly. Um, ArcGIS Pro, which is the next version, has Python 3, but at the moment we're dealing with Python 2.7. Um, but ArcGIS 10.4 came out late last year, around July. And ArcGIS 10.4, for the first time, has included Pandas as one of the standard Python libraries that comes with ArcGIS. So we can actually really easily incorporate our tools that use Pandas to read tabular data from Excel into our system for GIS data processing in ArcGIS. So if you look at it, there are really four main calculations. We have a simple calculation for manipulating GIS data. Uh, we have some simple calculations for reading Excel and CSVs. And then we can classify and aggregate our data and join the, join the results together. Now, I think I'm probably going a little slow, so I might pick up the pace quickly. But I'll show you the only bit of code that I'm going to show you in this presentation. Um, it has to be done. I'm at a Python conference, so I have to be able to show you a piece of code. But this is all the code that you need to take a ArcGIS, a spatial data object that is read by the ArcGIS ArcPy library, and transform that into a usable Pandas data frame. And as soon as you've got that, as soon as you've got a data frame, there is a gist up on GitHub that I posted, I think, on Thursday or Friday last week. Um, so get the address, there's a bit more error checking in the gist. But take this, you can use this, and then as soon as you've got some data in ArcGIS, and as soon as you've got some tabular data from somewhere else, you can actually start to match it together using pandas. And that's, everyone here as Python developers knows this, this is out of the box. Um, it's pretty easy to join data and to manipulate data in pandas. Um, and doing it this way allows us to do that really quickly and really fast. Okay, and it, you know, very quickly, I won't go through the output too much, but we update spatial features, we can symbolize it, we can update Excel tables, and we can log things out to a file. So I'll give you a quick example um, of exactly what we've done. I'll have a look at the proof of concept that we did up in New South Wales um, for the Barara National Park. So what we have here is Barara. These are the burn units in Barara. There's the dark orange points. So this is just north of Sydney. Okay? This is about if you were to drive there, it's about an hour and a half drive from Sydney Central up to Barara. And that's sort of in reasonable traffic. So it's not a long way from the CBD. Okay. We know that, for example, we have current risks. Um, New South Wales Parks and Wildlife Service updates file fuel load estimations on a regular basis. And it's a very simple way to convert that, from a, that fuel load measurement to a one to five scale. Basically, you can think of it as anything with more than 12 tons of fuel per hectare gets a five risk. That's a lot of fuel. Um, but obviously, depending on the type of vegetation, you can get more than that. So anything above that is a huge risk. And of course, NPWS has their own strategic values for all of these burn units as well. They've already been classified. They've known about this data for years. So we want to just make this as easy as possible. And we can see here in Barara, this is the simple one to five scale, red being risk, risky. Um, green being not so much. 
um, of fuel loads, and we have here strategic values. So if you remember the graph I showed you before, we can do the same thing. We can calculate our risk values very easily, and this is one of the outputs of the tool that we've built. Um, five minutes, okay, I really need to push on through. Um, so we can very easily calculate just the current risk level of this area, and we can calculate a baseline risk as well. Um, this is, by the way, the one to three unacceptable, acceptable conditional based on this, and this is just the per first part of the process. But um, we can also calculate baseline risks. So we can say that, you know, assuming that everywhere nothing has been controlled for years, assuming essentially anything, nothing has been burnt in that area for 10 years, will give you the maximum amount of fuel in that region, and therefore everything gets a five. So we can also compare. We can say, okay, compared to our original current fuel load, what is the baseline risk? And of course we can do that with historical data as well, and as well as our predictions. One of the nice things about doing the tool the way that we did it, because we did it with pandas, and because um, the guys on the team, not me, I'm standing back, um, give them the credit, who did all the actual work, um, did it so quickly, did it so efficiently, and because pandas is a really easy library to work with, we actually had some extra time in the end, which meant we could extend that tool a little bit as well, which is nice. So we can actually let people budget for this as well. So one of the other key outputs for any organization like NPWS when they're doing these burns is that these burns cost money, they're risky, they take time. Um, so using this tool, instead of them having to then sit there with these risk, at-risk areas and say, this is how much money it's gonna cost me to burn these areas off, that can just be a standard output of the tool as well. So the key take-homes, basically simple code gets good results. Um, we make it as simple as possible. We don't want ownership, we want um, the people at Parks New South Wales to have ownership, we give them the code. They use the tools. They're going to be using it every day. And we don't want um, people who don't have a lot of technical experience in writing code or having to write these tools, you know, we don't want that to get in the way of them doing this work. Um, the other thing, obviously, maps get people talking. Um, and we can reduce the time that the tool runs from hours to minutes. You know, a manual process takes hours or days. Dropping it down takes minutes. Okay. And we can, of course, extend the tool. Extending the tool is very easy because, again, Pandas is a very flexible and powerful library. Um, and dropping in something like that fuel calculation, oh, sorry, the cost calculation, is very simple to do. And we can go back and do other things as well. If we decide one day that we don't like that five by five risk matrix, that doesn't give us enough detail. Or it might give us too much. We can change that because that's just stored as a table. It's just stored as a table on, uh, within the Python file. So it's really, really easy to change it. Well, all we're doing is using Pandas to, do, to match data up. So what are the next steps? Okay, so this year, New South Wales is running a pilot project for uh, national park management areas across New South Wales are going to have this same risk process run when they're calculating all their burns. Um, and the basic idea is that we want to get data off people's desktops into a database. We want to make that as repeatable as possible. Um, and we can do that with pandas, we can do it with Python, and we can do it with simple automation of these tools. And finally, a couple of thanks. Um, Donnie, Carl, from New South Wales Parks and Wildlife and the Barara team. Uh, Jeff, Mike, Tom, give a wave. Um, and Anastasia for actually doing the hard yards. I get to stand up front and look important. Um, they actually have to do the work. And obviously the team behind Pandas. And last but not least, Hannah, my wife, who you know, would kick my ass if I um, <laughs> didn't thank her for this presentation. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, I think we have time for one or two short questions. Anyone? Thanks for the great talk. No worries. Is there any appetite for like a web-based thing? Ideally. I mean, one of, the, one of the things is that there's obviously a key spatial component for these kind of tools. Um, so for, for the pilot project, they've already got ArcGIS within their organization. So they've already got the, the heavyweight GIS application. But you want to make this as easy, easily accessible as possible. So there's no reason that you couldn't, for example, put that data into a web site, make a nice little map, and let people upload a table there. Um, so I'd say there would be. That'd be much easier for people to access. Um, there's not yet. We need to run the pilot program first with, across, the, obviously, the national parks to say that, yes, this worked. No, this didn't. This is what's got to change. But once that's down, then yeah, absolutely. Oh, Henry, the, you know, the, I remember. Uh, Esri, you know, the Acumap, uh, you know, the, the company actually mm -hmm. uh, was quite, you know, the uh, exposed very limited uh, function of uh, 
ArcMap to Python. Mm. And the right now, the you know the they're more serious about the Python. You know the they have been for a number of years. So Esri introduced Python in version nine. Um, it was very locked down. It was a basic scripting environment. Um, you could do some calculations. You could manipulate a bit of data, and you could run the tools that they already had in the system. Now you can do a lot more. And every time they release a new version, they open up more of the of uh, their underlying system to Python. And the reason is is basically because Python's accessible. You don't need to sit there and compile. You don't need Visual Studio to write in Arc objects. So for Esri, they've got a much, much larger uptake of Python uh, in ArcGIS than I think even they were expecting. Um, so they've just been opening up more and more, which has been really great to see. So you can see that they've been including other libraries, all sorts in there. And the libraries these days are actually quite powerful. We can do things like symbolizing data properly um, and all the rest. OK. I think we run out of time. We thank you once more time. And here you have the speaker's mug. Thank you. Bye. See you.